since the time that the concept of the atom was developed, which I believe dates back to the ancient Greeks, our model for understanding the structure of an atom has changed over time as technology has evolved. Three things that don't really change about our understanding of an atom is one, it's the basic building block of matter. Two, it cannot be broken down chemically. And three, it represents a single unit of an element. In other words, if I had one carbon, I would have an atom of carbon. One oxygen would be an atom of oxygen. Now we move into the earliest and then most recent atomic models, all the way through, starting with John Dalton. Dalton, who lived back in the late 17 and early to mid 1800s, is known as the founder of atomic theory. Dalton's postulates are given below, and you need to memorize them because they will show up from time to time on the Regents' exam. The first is that all matter is composed of indivisible particles, like the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, one nation under indivisible. Indivisible means it can't be broken down. Um, now, we should probably include, again, it's chemically indivisible. Because in today's science, we know we can perform nuclear reactions that can split an atom. But chemically, you can't divide or decompose an atom. All atoms of a given element are identical. Atoms of different elements are different. That sums up number two. All carbons are identical, but all carbons are unique when compared to, say, oxygen or fluorine or nitrogen. And the identical thing is up for grabs a little bit because we'll learn about isotopes later. They're not necessarily identical in mass. And again, as we learn more and technology improves, um, our models get modified. This is one thing we now know. Not all carbons are identical in mass. It's carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. But in properties, they are. Compounds are formed by a combination or of two or more atoms. This one, I want you to draw a little arrow up to. And we're going to say of different elements. Two atoms of oxygen combined chemically give us an oxygen molecule. That's not a compound, it's a diatomic molecule. Two atoms of oxygen reacting with carbon give us CO2. Now we have atoms of different elements. That's a compound. Atoms cannot be created, destroyed, or converted into other kinds of atoms during chemical reactions. This is true. Okay, and next most importantly is Dalton's actual model, which he's uh, credited for back in uh, 1803, which is the cannonball theory or the cannonball model. So when you hear cannonball, you need to think Dalton. When you think Dalton, you need to think cannonball. The good news about this one is that hopefully all of you can relate to what a cannonball would look like. I'm, you may have never held a cannonball in your hands, but you can imagine it's dense, it's spherical. That's Dalton's model. Um, it's logical that it would be circular uh, in nature, so it's pretty straightforward. Dalton's model, the cannonball model, said that the atom, atoms of any element, would be spherical and uniform in density. Our next scientist who developed um, the next model that we focus on is J.J. Thompson. In 1897, was credited with developing what we call the plum pudding theory or model. And what you have to understand about the plum pudding is it's not the kind of pudding you think of, like jello gelatin pudding. Pudding, for the English, is like a muffin, bread. So plum, and the plums are not big plums, like they're raisins. 
basically. So what the plum pudding model amounts to is raisin bread or a raisin muffin. J.J. Thompson's model, and you can see it over here, was that you had these negative particles embedded in a fluffy positiveness. And that he termed as his plum pudding model. A positive pudding and negative electron plums. He used a cathode ray tube. And it's actually better that I show you than try to explain to you. Cathode ray tube is an old school TV, basically. And he used electric charges to see if he could deflect that ray and make it move, change its behavior. So if you watch, he'll shoot the cathode ray up to this plate where it will make an image, a fluorescent image. When he introduced charged plates to that cathode ray, right about almost now, he applied an electric field, and you see the negative plate at the top, positive at the bottom. Well, the cathode ray got pulled down toward the negative, toward the positive, away from the negative. The negative repelled the ray. The positive attracted the ray. That means the cathode ray is negative. He applied a magnetic field. The same thing happened. We know this through physics that um, electricity and magnetics are very closely related. So what he ended up determining is that this cathode ray contained these negatively charged particles, which he then called electrons. He went further and actually discovered the charge to mass ratio of the electron, but we don't need to get into all that. So he's credited with discovering the subatomic particle called the electron. That's huge and discovering that it was both small and negatively charged. He's not credited quite with knowing really where the electrons were or how they behaved. That came later. So when you hear J.J. Thompson, you need to think plum pudding theory or model, and you need to think electrons. He discovered the electron. And then lastly, at the bottom, we have J.J. Walker, who has absolutely nothing to do with chemistry or electrons. But if you click on that link, you'll see one of my favorite TV catchphrases of all time from Kid Dynamite.